Okay, welcome to our second video on section 3.2, and at the end of our last video, 3.2a, we just introduced the new rule constructive dilemma, articulated as follows, okay? Um, and here you have an example problem which asks you to employ constructive dilemma so you can see it in action. Um, pause now and see if you can um, show this argument syntactically valid. So you're given these three strings as premises, and you've got to manipulate them to get this string. Pause now. Okay, so hopefully you're able to get this one. And again, the trick and the thing I want to emphasize, you know, sometimes it can be hard to spot CD because um, you might have like eight lines and three of them somewhere in there yield a application of CD that can be very useful. That can happen, okay, and so it can be difficult to spot that way, but um, you just have to kind of read through your lines carefully, and the more practice problems you do, the better you'll, you'll get at that kind of thing. But in this particular case, what I wanted to show you was that, you know, P, Q, and R, and S can be very, very complex. So in this case, P is this conjunction here, right? Q is this negation. Look at R is this fairly complex sentence, and S is this fairly complex sentence, but you know, if either this thing or this thing, whatever it is, that's just P or Q, all right? And if the first thing, right, then this thing. And by the way, these don't have to be in the in the same order, okay? Um, and then, uh, yeah, and so then you see here what you get out is R or S. So you got D if and only if not E or not not G, right, which is right here. And I've got the values listed here for you. And that's a really interesting feature of... Um, or it's a really interesting um, rule. And one thing I want to talk about with you, I'm going to give you an example in a second, but just let me explain it this way while we've got this open. There's a special case for constructive dilemma that I want to draw to your attention. It's kind of neat, okay? Um, so one of the special cases, and this I'm not giving you a new rule here. I'm just using this to illustrate to you. Suppose that R and S were the same. So they were both R or both S, okay? Um, suppose that either P is true or Q is true, and suppose further that P implies R as well as Q implies R. Well, it turns out that you can get all the way down to just S, and it's not by CD. CD is part of it, but it's not the only thing. So, uh, But it is possible sort of to use our rules, including CD, to get from these three all the way down to this guy. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So again, it's when R and S are the same. Let me let me give you an example here. Okay, so I've returned constructive dilemma to its original state, but we're sort of imagining a situation where R and S are the same. So take a look at this particular case right here, okay? See if you can um, show that this argument is syntactically valid. So can you move from these three strings to this string? Excuse me, this should be uh, G all by itself like this, okay? See if you can figure out how to do that. You might have to use constructive dilemma along the way. Pause now. Okay, so here's your example, okay? Um, so here's the premises. And then we use constructive dilemma to get G or G in this particular case. And again, it's just R or S. It's just that R and S happen to be the same thing in this case. And so you get G or G. And then we can use our old rule from... Uh, 3.1 idempotence to go from G or G just to straight G by itself. So these three lines do syntactically imply uh, this line. These three sequences of symbols imply this sequence of symbols, okay? Now, um, that's kind of a really interesting, fun application to note, so I'm glad you got to see it. Um, and notice that, you know, we started building on using some of our old rules. So some of the problems and the exercises ask you to start combining these things, all right? So I'm going to do one such example here and then leave you to uh, check out some of the exercises in the text. But let's do one full example together. Okay, so let's do this problem together, okay? And you might have to draw on several different rules in order to... Um, solve it so don't give up right away and again you you have to practice these regularly to get good at it so um let's go ahead and uh try this one you're given four strings these four and you have to deduce this string syntactically from these four okay so um 
go ahead and pause now and give this a shot and we'll do it together and I'll give you some hints along the way. Pause now. Okay, so I've got you set up here. That's the first thing you want to do is you want to get yourself set up, all right? So you've got some lines in front of you and um, you know, I don't know how many steps this is going to take yet necessarily, but we're going to give this a shot. So um, the first thing I might do is, you know, I'm going to look at my conclusion. I'm going to say, okay, where does my conclusion appear in my givens? Well, it appears here, and that's the only place it appears. So I've got some attention on line one, which is nice. Now, what about uh, if I had, for example, um, some combinatorial play? Right, so for example, I notice right away that three and four have something in common. And then I ask myself, is there a rule that allows me to exploit the commonality, the relationship between three and four? And there is. Pause now and see if you can figure out what it is. Okay, so hopefully you're able to get it, but you know, this yields not not a by disjunctive syllogism on uh, three and four, okay? There's a similar thing that's available from two and si uh, from two and uh, four, right? There's a disjunctive syllogism available on two and four. So what does disjunctive syllogism on two and four yield here in line six? What's it give you? Okay, it gives you the right disjunct, which is this. Okay, and I'll remove the parentheses just for readability, but you can imagine them there. All right, so, so far, so good. And look at that, we've got some new things and we've used three and four and we've used two. We haven't used one yet. So at this point we might look at one and see if we can bring one to bear on things somehow here. So uh, pause now and see if you can use premise one at this point. Is there a rule given what we have available that will allow us to sort of use premise one? Okay, so it's also disjunctive syllogism, right? So disjunctive syllogism on one, but on five this time. So what does one and five by disjunctive syllogism yield? Okay, that's my question for you. Well, it yields B or C, okay? All right, so this is just because I'm familiar with the rules, right? And I've had a lot of practice with it. Okay, so uh, let's remind ourselves of what we're trying to get. We're trying to get C. Okay, so you can pause this at any point and try to work it out. I've got C here, which is really nice. All right, but um, what else can I do here? Does anybody, do you see anything? I'll give you a hint in a second. Okay, so here's your hint. When in doubt, look for combinations. Combinations require similarities in sentences. Here's a sentence that has a similarity with this sentence. There's your hint. See if you can figure that out. So six and four have something in common. That's the key thing that I noticed. All right. Now how can you exploit that commonality for effect? Okay, so four and six are going to combine via modus tollens. Okay, so four and six combine via modus tollens. Um, what does that yield? Okay, well it yields not B in this particular case, which is pretty interesting. All right. And so let's go ahead and see if you can't uh, finish this thing from there. Remember, you're trying to get C all by itself. Okay, so once more disjunctive syllogism, this time on 7 and 8, all right, is going to yield uh, C. And so it turns out that you can get from these, um, from these strings, okay, from these four strings to this relatively simple string using only our rules, okay? And we use DS a lot, but that's the point, okay? You're gonna have to look for combinations and look to use different rules. Some of them you have to use multiple times, okay? And uh, as we build in complexity, we're gonna take more and more of these rules for granted. Okay, Logic fans, uh, that's it for this video. We covered the um, rules of inference for the arrow today, okay? So let me put up the recap. So the rules of inference we covered today were modus ponens, 
modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, and constructive dilemma. And we're going to keep introducing um, some of these rules. And by the way, all these rules we introduced, these are sort of historically important ones. They're, they're ones that you naturally find um, people employing in ordinary conversation, in mathematics, and in any intellectual endeavor. People make these kinds of maneuvers all the time, but we're showing you the, the actual groundwork of why these inferences work. All right, guys, we'll catch you on the next video.